do you introduce somebody that every one of us is in this room knows? How do you introduce somebody that for most of us has had an incredible part in our life as a father of revival, an apostle of revival, we have learned so much over the years through the things that God has imparted to uh, John Kilpatrick, who's coming in a moment to share the word of the Lord with us. So I thought I'd put it this way. And Pastor Kilpatrick, Kerry Robertson said to me the other day, you tell Pastor John, I said hello, and I'm praying for him. And, uh, but here's what Kerry Robertson said to me. He said, I've learned this. Now, for those who do not know, Kerry Robertson served as, as a senior associate with Pastor Kilpatrick. And Kerry said, I learned two things. John talks to Jesus. Jesus talks to John. And I believe that Jesus has been saying some things to John that we need to hear. Would you stand with me and let's welcome John as he comes. John Kilpatrick coming to share what Jesus has been saying to him. You may be seated. Thank you. I may preach with my coat on tonight. Is that okay? I'm from South Alabama, and this weather's a little bit cold up here. I woke up this morning, and I was not chilled, but I had the window open in my coach, and I got a little bit cold. And so I just wanted to let you know that I'm good. Don't want anybody to worry. I lost my sense of taste and smell this morning, but I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I can't quit coughing, but I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. No, I'm, I'm cutting up with you. Let me get situated here just for a minute. Cut me down a little bit, guys. I'm going to speak with this coat on. And a um, little bit, got a little bit cold this morning with my window open. And so I'm just going to take care of myself. You know, I feel called to watch out for my wife's first husband. enjoy coming here. I think this is my fifth or sixth time being here. Always enjoy coming. Man, alive. <clears throat> There's some people in this building. Man, I think this is the biggest crowd I've ever seen here. Pastor, God bless you. Where are you at? Cut me down a little bit. Cut me down just a little bit, guys. Pastor, you made me sit this morning back there in that room. I didn't ever get to preach. I'm really upset about it, <laughs> but I completely understand. I'm, I'm cutting up with you. Now, I, you know, I always enjoy coming to Terre Haute. I used to pastor in Evansville, Indiana. Cut me down a little bit more, guys. I used to pastor in Evansville, Indiana, and uh, yeah, somebody from Evansville. God have mercy on your soul. <laughs> We lived there for three years. I pastored Calvary Temple in Evansville, and I used to have to go through Terre Haute all the time when I went to the hospitals in Indianapolis, and I remember coming through here and on 70 and getting off and going back down to Evansville. But I have, I have a lot of memories of Indiana and uh, made a lot of friends up here in this part of the world, and I especially love coming here to Terre Haute. Pastor is one of the greatest friends. He's just a great friend. He really is. This guy loves God. <clears throat> Him and his wife rides Harleys. Can you believe that? They ride Harleys. He don't look like the Harley type. You look more like the Honda type. The Honda type. Oh, 
<laughs> Brother Lyman Good, where's Brother Lyman Good? There he is. God bless you, man. So good to see you. You still going to New Zealand a lot? Are you? Yeah. This is a dear brother. Yeah. You, you still doing a lot of work there in New Zealand? Yeah. How many ministers do we have here tonight? If, you, if you're in the ministry full time, just stand up if you will. Goodness gracious, look at this. Man, a lot. Man, up in the balcony, there's a lot of preachers here. Man, so good to be here and so good to be able to have this opportunity to speak into your lives. Um, <clears throat> cut me down just a little bit more because <clears throat> I sound like an Episcopalian right now, but I will sound like a Pentecostal in a few minutes. <laughs> I have some messages with me. I'm just going to take just a minute and talk about them. I'm not going to talk about them at length. I, um, some of these are single messages, but I'm just finishing a series right now at home. It's entitled, When Prayer Alone Will Not Work. And it, how many of y'all have heard that? Yeah, wow, goodness gracious. So we're still preaching that. I'll be preaching the last part of it this week. It deals with fasting. It's a different angle on fasting, I think, that some of you may have heard. <clears throat> but um, when prayer alone will not work, Jesus said, this kind cometh out only by fasting and prayer. And um, right now what the Lord is speaking to me is that there's so many things that's going on in the nation and in the world that prayer alone is not going to get the job done. It's going to take some fasting. And back in the old days, in Abraham Lincoln's day, George Washington's day, and many of the other powerful presidents that we had that were God-fearing presidents, they would call occasionally when the nation was facing big issues, they would call days of humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I hear a lot of conspiracy theories. And I see a lot of Christians get worked up about different things. And I hear a lot of talk and a lot of discussion but I don't hear a lot of prayer, and I certainly don't see a lot of fasting in prayer. So I think fasting is going to be the key that's going to put it over and will turn things. I'll be preaching the last part this coming Sunday at home. But anyway, uh, there's five parts I've preached already. I've got one more part to preach. It'll be six parts. I'm thinking seriously about writing a book on it as soon as I finish the parts. I'm thinking about having it translated into a book, trans transcribed into a book. Because it's a different slant on, on prayer. It's a different slant on fasting. Just different maybe than a lot of things you've heard. So it's interesting. I've been fasting some. My church has been fasting. Wow. You want to hear a testimony? Yeah. Let me tell you a testimony real quick. Our church has been fasting. I've been fasting. My wife's been fasting. Many people in the church have been fasting. Well, I get this email today or yesterday. Well, I can't remember from this lady that I used to pastor. She was a teenager back then, and I pastored them when I was in my second church in Georgia. I was there from the time I was 23 years old to the time I was 29 years old, before I went to Evansville. And so I was the pastor there, and they were teenagers, but I was just a few years older than them. Well, now she's 60 years old. She's in the hospital in Emory University, and she had a heart transplant and was dying, literally dying. They got her on hospice at Emory. So last Sunday morning, I got up and I had a guest speaker and I was getting ready to introduce the guest speaker, or getting ready to have someone introduce the guest speaker. And I just all of a sudden felt led to pray for people that's going through mental battles, mental battles, mental attack. Mental, really mental attack. Not just dreams and nightmares, but mental attack, heavy attack. So I started praying for people and then I said, I want everybody in the church to turn around and face the camera on the jib. So my whole church turned around and I said, extend your hands toward the camera. Well, the doctor was in this lady's room. She's 60 years old now. Her brother had been watching our worship that morning. And she said right before we came on and started praying, she heard her brother and she looked over and he was crying. He was laughing and crying in the spirit. And she said tears were running down his face. And so the doctor had just given her a major shot because 
her heart, her body was rejecting the heart and it was kicking off blood clots that was going through her lungs and her heart. And it had done so much damage in her heart that the doctor told her that he said, we got you on hospice because he said, you're, you're, all, you're more where you're going than where you are now. You, you're dying and you don't have long. So she said, while we were praying, she looked in the camera and while we were praying, we had our hands stretched forth like this. <clears throat> and she said, the doctors gave her that shot. And he said, it's a very powerful shot. And he said, the likely, likelihood of you coming out of this is not good. So when they gave her the shot, we was praying, had our hands extended, we were praying. And she couldn't even get up out of the bed, couldn't even lift her arms to even drink water out of a glass. And so all of a sudden she says she felt warmth come over her and she pushed up and sat up in the bed, just sat up in the bed. And the doctor said, whoa, my goodness, I think it worked. I think it worked. Well, she told me today, I, I called her today on the telephone. She wanted me to call her and I called her on the phone. She told me the story. First time I heard it this afternoon, she said, pastor, she said a while ago, the nurse came in and said, honey, you look so good and you're doing so good. We're not gonna send you to the hospice across town. The doctor says, we think we're gonna send you home. Now, I, I attribute a lot of that to people's hands that was raised toward that camera. That was fasting and praying. I attribute a lot of that to people that was fasting and praying. I believe right now that we're in a time where God is God is up to something. I can't quite define what he's up to. I can't quite describe it to you. But I know he's up to something. I can feel it. I can feel it in my own life. I can feel it in my own ministry. Which leads me to come here tonight and just, just tell you real quickly that <clears throat> I have some things that I want you to pick up if you want to go by our table back there. We're not going to be back there long because we're heading home tonight right after the service. But I just got through preaching a message about spellbound, and this has to do with COVID, and it has to do with the medical aspect of COVID, but it has to do with the spirit that came in with COVID. And how many of you knows it is a spirit that came in? It is a bewitching spirit. It's a bewitching spirit that came in with COVID. And I wish I had time to talk about it. I don't. I don't want to take up my preaching time. I just got through preaching this message at, at church. It's called High Places. God's dealing with high places. I, I, went, I walked through the Old Testament. I dealt with this, and I'm dealing with high places today, including our own lives. And so this is very interesting. I would really encourage you to pick, a, pick up a copy of that. You preachers especially, I think you can get some really good messages from that. This is a message concerning Jezebel. I preached on the, uh, I preached about the power of place, the power of position. And what Jezebel is after is she's after your position and she's after your place and she's after your power. And everybody has been designated a place by the Holy Spirit. Everybody carries an authority that God intends for you to carry. If you're nothing more than just a father or a mother, whoever you may be, there's a position, a place, position, and authority. And that's what Satan's after. When Satan came in the garden, he didn't go to the hippopotamus. When Satan came in the garden, he didn't go to the giraffe. He went to Adam and Eve. What was he after? Their position, their position and their authority. And I want to tell you something, preachers. He's after your position. And he's after your authority. And don't you let him have it. God is giving a special anointing right now to ministers and their families and their staff to hold on to your position. And God's going to give you more power now than you've ever had. Just don't capitulate and give in. This is called power brokers. Unmasking the deception of the Jezebel spirit. You need to hear this. This is not a typical Jezebel sermon. And then back in uh, December of 2019 the Lord gave me a word and I gave it to my church and everything was looking great Trump was president the stock market was bordering on 30,000 the economy was hitting on all eight cylinders everything was cooking like a pressure cook, major just everything going great I woke up one morning I went to the restroom I came back home I came back to the bed laid down 
And I just laid there for a few moments and was thinking, and I just turned over in the bed. And when I turned over in the bed, I turned over into another world. Never heard a word, and I never heard a word spoken, articulated, and in, in, out loud. But whenever I turned over, I turned over into another world. <clears throat> and the Lord said to me in my spirit, he said, tell the people, extremely perilous times are coming. Now, this was December the 19th of 2019. This is before COVID or anything. Tell the people, extremely perilous times are coming. He said, but tell them not to be concerned because I'm sending my angels to hell. And so he said, they will come and the angels will help. What the Lord gave me was, he gave me a series of messages on angels. The angels are coming. That's what he said, the angels are coming. But what I began to see was a revelation that God was giving me that I'm not taking away from Christ and I'm not taking away from the Holy Spirit whenever I talk about angels, but I want you to hear what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. God the Father is like the paternal spirit. He's the Father. Jesus is like the brother. The Holy Spirit is like the mother, the maternal spirit. The Holy Spirit hovers sits on the eggs like a mother hen. The Holy Spirit comforts. The Holy Spirit guides. The Holy Spirit goes with us as a paraclete, stands beside us. But you don't see the Holy Spirit taking the authority when it comes time to have, to have muscle. God looks to the angels for muscle. He looks to the angels for muscle. And so the Holy Spirit is there to comfort those who mourn to guide and to illuminate and to give revelation, but you don't see him taking on things like delivering Peter from prison. And the gates open up and Peter's leaving the prison and he's going out and the angels are leading him out. They're the muscle of heaven. The angels are the muscle. And the Lord said to me, tell the people that I'm sending my angels and they're going to help them. And in the wilderness, when Israel went into the wilderness after they left Egypt, the Bible says that Moses told the Lord, he said, Lord, I am not going on this journey unless you go with us. And what the Lord said, okay, he said, I'm gonna send my angel. So when the angel led Israel through the wilderness, the angel is the one that went before them when Pharaoh was coming up after them, when the, when the Pharaoh's army was coming up behind them, and Israel was trying to get across with their animals and their children and the women. They were crossing over and the Red Sea was heaped up. And here comes the, the Egyptians and they're coming up fast on the rear. The Bible said that the angel of the Lord left the head of the nation of Israel, the 2.5 the million people, went to the rear and the angel defended those Jews crossing the Red Sea and put darkness between the Egyptians and the Jews and the Jews had light. So in times of great crisis, the angels are there to help us. So I just want to say this, don't get all spooky and start trying to talk to angels. <laughs> don't get all spooky and start praying to angels, but I'm just here to tell you, all hell is gonna be breaking out, but be encouraged, the angels are coming. I said the angels are coming. And it's going to be, it is going to be an amazing, Time between now and the time that Jesus returns and catches the church away, it's going to be an amazing time. There's going to be so many things written in the next little while about the church and the final days on the earth before the rapture that I want you to get in on it. I want your name to be included in the great things that God's about to do with the people of God. I want my name in there. And I'm not talking about an extension of the Bible. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about God keeps chronicles of everything that he does. And so these are the days of chronicles. And I want to be right in the middle where John Kilpatrick believed God. John Kilpatrick didn't get discouraged. He didn't run off after some woman. He didn't, he didn't get discouraged and quit. He didn't go into depression. John Kilpatrick believed God. I want to hear you believe God in the worst of times. It's not time to give up. It's not time to give out. It's time to press ahead. Somebody shout amen.
So the title of this message is The Angels Are Coming. And I really enjoyed preaching this. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Hey, where's some pastors at? Let me just see. Okay, somebody get him a new pair of glasses. <laughs> well, today I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of something that until I started preaching on it, I can't say that I ever heard a sermon on it. And that does, that's not putting any roses on me. I'm not saying that, don't get me wrong, but I had never heard a sermon on this subject until I preached on it. And when I experienced it for the first time on Father's Day of 95 at Brownsville, it, it, it really set me back on my heels. I've never felt anything or experienced anything like it. And since I experienced it, I can't get enough of it. I'm gonna be preaching on the glory of God tonight. I'm gonna be preaching on the mysteries of the glory. Y'all wanna say with me? There's a big difference between the glory of God and the anointing of God. I'm going to explain that in just a moment. Let me read my scriptures first. If you'd like to stand, stand with me. And we'll look at these scriptures together. This will give you a chance to get the blood flowing. Because believe me, I didn't get to preach this morning. And by crackies, I'm going to make up for it tonight. In Exodus Chapter 33 and verse 18, Moses said to the Lord, I beseech thee, show me your glory. That's what Moses asked God. He said, I beseech thee, show me your glory. And then Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 14, it said, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge. <clears throat> it didn't say be filled with the glory. It said be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea before the Lord comes back. Now, let me tell you what I feel like God has me on the road for right now. I pastor a church. I'm there just about every Sunday, rarely miss. And I love being behind my own pulpit. I love my congregation. But whenever I travel, I really feel like the Lord has me on the road to talk about the glory. Because many people don't know about it. Many people don't understand it. So, <clears throat> in talking about the glory... The Bible said in the last days that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory. So I feel like the Lord's got me out here because I've experienced it. And that doesn't make me special. But I've experienced it so I can talk about it with a little bit of intelligence. I'm not an expert on it, but a little bit of intelligence. And the church where I pastored in Brownsville in Pensacola, four and a half million people came through the doors in five years. So there was something there that drew that many people. How many of you know you can't put an advertisement in the paper and draw four and a half million people? It's just impossible. You can't do it. So something had to be there. I happened to have a place on the platform. I had a seat on the platform. I had a parking place. And I saw God do great and mighty things in that five-year revival. But one of the things that has stuck with me and will always stick with me to my dying day will be the feeling of the weighty presence of the glory of God. It is the most therapeutic, wonderful, peaceful feeling that I've ever had in my life. So I want to talk about it tonight. Now I will tell you this. I used to go on the road and, and I had a series of sermons, about 10 sermons that I preached on the glory. And I'd go on the road and I'd hold my product up, be talking about my, my product and my, I'd hold that up on the glory and I'd say the title of this series is The Glory. And I'd start talking about the glory. And while I started talking about it, people started getting under the glory and started falling over in their seats. I had to quit talking about my series on the road. <laughs> they got to where they just fall over in the seat, you know. And I got to where myself I'd be talking about it. And I had to quit talking about it and run back up on the platform and shake it off where I could preach. What you talk about will come. You talk trouble, trouble will come. You talk sickness, sickness will come. 
You talk division, division will come. But you talk the glory, and the glory will come. That's what I want to do tonight. I want to talk on the glory of God, and I'm going to speak on it for about an hour. And whenever I get through, we're going to believe the Lord that God is going to pour out his glory in your life and in your church, in your ministry. Can you say amen? amen. So in Habakkuk it says, and the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You may be seated. Thank you. If you will, please, everybody, cut your cell phones off. <clears throat> Give me your best ear for about the next 50 minutes to an hour. Tonight, I want to make it crystal clear before I get started in preaching on the glory of God that I'm in no way trying to put more value on the glory than I am on the shed blood of Christ. Could I please say to you right up front that there's nothing more important and there's nothing more valuable than the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary for all of our sins. There's nothing more important than that. The next thing is I don't want to uh, make anybody feel like that I'm preaching on the glory of God and I'm putting that above the uh, Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because I'm not. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, he's the second, he's the third person in the adorable Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is one of the Godhead. So you can't top that. But when I start talking about the glory of God, I'm not going to not talk about the glory of God because I feel like right now, this is sort of the way things are trending. And I feel like in light of everything that's happened in 2020, and I feel like in light of everything that's going on right now and has been going on this year, from January till now in March, I feel like that the glory of God is now beginning and about to manifest in tremendous ways that may take many people in the church world by surprise, and they might not know what it is. So my purpose in being here is I want to talk about it so when it begins to manifest, you can say, I know what that is. That's the glory of God right there. So here we go. I was asked recently, Brother Kilpatrick, why all this talk about the excitement uh, concerning the glory of God? And so I asked the Lord. I said, well, Lord, People's asking me this question, what, how do I respond to them? He said, well, didn't I say in my word that the latter house, the glory on the latter house would be greater than the former? He said the former had some major glory on it, but if the latter is going to have more glory on the latter house than the former, you better be talking about it. So the Holy Spirit is a person, but the glory of God is not a person. The glory of God is not a place. The glory of God is an environment. That's what it is. Now let me say those two things again before I get started. The Holy Spirit is a person. The glory of God is not a person. It doesn't have a personality. The glory of God is not a place. The glory of God is an atmosphere. It's an environment. So God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere. You go to the furthest planet in our solar system and beyond, and the Lord is there. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he's there. If I go to the highest mountain, he's there. God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But he does not manifest his presence everywhere. In the days of the Old Testament, God didn't manifest his presence among the Malachites, the Hittites, the Perizzites. He did not manifest his presence in other nations. He manifested it through the seed of Abraham because he was in covenant with Abraham. God manifests his presence only among his people because his people reverenced his presence and they reverenced his glory and God will manifest his glory to those that love it and reverence it. To those that don't, they won't have a manifestation of the glory of God most likely. Now, God usually manifests himself in two different areas. He manifests himself where he's worshipped in spirit and truth. 
and also where he's continually honored and reverenced. God sometime will reveal his glory as Shekinah. Shekinah glory means that he'll manifest his presence to humans through physical phenomena such as fire, clouds, or a light that can be seen. Oft times, the second way God reveals his glory is through the kabod, K-A-B-O-D, kabod, or K-A-B-O-U-D, which means glory. In the body, the word for liver in your body is a similar word to kabod, K-A-B-O-U-D. The Greek word in your body for the liver is, is kabod because it's the heaviest organ in your body. The word for the glory is a root word called kabod, and it means that's where God manifests his presence by a weighty manifest presence that is felt but not really seen, but it's felt. It's holy. It's comforting, it's therapeutic, it's weighty. In the Bible, you find that whenever God made Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden, they were clothed with the glory. Adam and Eve was clothed with the glory. And they met with the Lord, and when they had the glory on them, they could talk to God face to face. No intimidation, no inferiority complex at all. He could look at God in the face, and correspond with God, God could look at him in the face. Adam was the highest order of intelligence, the highest order of homo sapien. His face was chiseled with intelligence. No sickness, no death, no evil thoughts, no double-mindedness. He was chiseled as a God-man right under God, God's son, not his only begotten son, but God's son that he had placed all of his creation under Adam, and Adam was a beauty. Eve was of the highest order of homo sapien. And they were clothed with the glory. They were naked, but they were clothed with the glory, and they were always naked. Only when they sinned did they start reaching out for leaves and whatever to try to cover their nakedness. Why was they trying to cover their nakedness? Because that weighty presence of God lifted off of them. Can I tell you something? Ever since man in the garden has lost the glory, he's been reaching for things to try to bring that weighty presence back. Investments won't do it. Money won't do it. Popularity won't do it. A new home won't do it. Alcohol won't do it. Pornography won't do it. Only the presence of the glory of God will bring you what you're looking for. Come on, give him praise. And the Bible says that when they sinned, the glory lifted off of them, and mankind began to reach immediately for leaves trying to cover up. They And the Lord said, who told you you were naked? Well, they felt so light. They felt so vulnerable. They felt so exposed. That weighty presence wasn't on them anymore. So, in the beginning, I want to contrast the glory with the anointing. In the beginning, many people don't understand the glory of God and the anointing of God. They use it interchangeably like it's the same thing, and it's far, far different. The glory is not the anointing, and the anointing is not the glory. Well, what is the anointing? The anointing is God's authorization on your life to do the works of the ministry in the earth. It is God's stamp of approval, like Ford Manufacturing Company out of Detroit has a dealership here in Terre Haute. Ford Manufacturing in Detroit has a dealership in South Alabama where I live. Anyone that's anointed is authorized by heaven to do the works of heaven in the earth under the anointing. It means you're an authorized representative of God's power, God's supernatural power. So that means you're authorized and you're anointed to do the works of the ministry in the earth. You have the anointing. But let me tell you about the glory. When under the anointing, 
there's power coming from you. Like, for example, Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throngs you. And they press on you and you say, who touched me? Jesus said, well, somebody has touched me because I felt virtue go out of me. What he was saying is, somebody got close enough to me to lay a demand on my anointing. And I felt the anointing leave me and go into somebody. Now, who was it? So the anointing is when the power of God flows out of you into somebody else. But the glory of God, the glory of God is different. When we experience the glory, it's not us that's working anymore. Now it's God that's working. Now it's a realm of rest. We don't do anything. We don't need to touch anybody. We don't need to go around and give a prophetic word to anybody. We've already moved in that anointing. We've already prophesied. We've already preached. We've already laid hands on people. And that's where people leave. It's when the anointing gets through moving, but we're leaving too early. We need to wait until the glory shows up. Our forefathers in early Pentecost, the way Pentecost was in early America years ago is they would operate under the anointing. They would fast. They would pray. They would pray for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. They would pray for the sick. They'd lay hands on them. They'd be healed. And just have a great service. But then before they went home, People would be gathered around the altar. People would be sitting in the floor. People would be crying and praying with one another. And they would wait in the presence of God until the glory would show up. Now what's the glory? The glory is when you don't do anything. The glory comes and you've got to be sensitive to know when to stop moving in the anointing and be quiet and be still and wait upon the Lord. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Now listen to me real quickly. Here's one thing that I have that's a problem for me. Now I'm not criticizing. I'm just telling you what I see, what I observe. I'm not criticizing these people. But when it comes to a lot of these churches today, they want to have a service that's an hour or less. And that may sound pretty good to people that don't want to spend much time in church and don't want to spend much time in the presence of the Lord. That may sound pretty good. Dip in, get you a little bit, go home. Maybe it'll last you for a few days until I've got back next week. But here's what happens. You have these churches that are growing like crazy. It's because they have an hour or less service. People come in, they hear some worship. They hear the preacher preach or lecture. At least he's not preaching, he's lecturing, really. He's giving a little lecture. There's no speaking in tongues. There's no manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's no moving of the Holy Spirit. So they come in. We herd them in and herd them out. Y'all leave. Hurry up. We've got other people waiting to get in. Everything's in a hurry. But there is no waiting on the Lord to come into the church and to minister to his people. The old timers used to call it the glory. And what they'll say is, we're going to pray, and we're going to preach, and we're going to prophesy until the glory comes, and then we're going to wait for the Lord to touch us and refresh us. Now listen to this. When the glory comes, you realize now there's no longer any need to operate in faith or in the anointing. Now it's just time for everybody to be on a level playing field and to wait for the Lord to touch you. We work under the anointing. We work under the anointing, but we rest under the glory. So you've got to learn to balance between operating in the anointing and allowing the Holy Spirit to come and refresh people. People get real nervous in church today in America when it comes to being quiet and letting God do his thing. Everybody's comfortable when the preacher does his thing. And everybody's comfortable when the worship team does their thing. But when we're waiting on God to do his thing, we get real spooky about that. And we're thinking, oh, this is weird. No, friend, this is exactly what you need. You need for the presence of God to come in. And, oh, come on, give him praise. I, I feel that. Oh. Woo. 
Now let me just share this with you before I go any further in the message. I want to say this before I forget it. Here's what I believe. Now, this is what I believe. I just want you to listen to it. You check it out and see what you think about it. I will always treasure the anointing and I'll move under the anointing and I can't function without the anointing. Trust me. But I believe that God is about to introduce to the people of God in the church world now a level of his presence called the glory. And I believe in the glory there's going to be a greater level of miracles than we've ever seen before. <laughs> I believe it's going to be a greater level of miracles. I believe in the glory there's going to be a greater level of divine healings, even with limbs growing out. Even with eyes being replaced, all kinds of things, in the glory, I believe in the glory. And I'm going to explain this to you in just a minute when I talk about Jesus. I believe that the church is about to transition. We hadn't transitioned just yet, but we're about to leave this place, and we're about to go to this place. And there's a lot of trepidation in leaving this place in order to go to this place. But let me just tell you something. I've had a peek. Don't be afraid to leave this place because where we're going is going to be a much better place. It's going to be a much better place. But I believe that we're about to enter into a, a level of the glory of God where there's going to be miracles that will be absolutely undeniable and indisputable. I remember one time at Brownsville, the glory of God would come in during worship. And Lyndall Cooley would lead us into areas of worship in the Brownsville Revival. And that's when the glory would usually come in is in deep worship. It wasn't spooky. It wasn't put on. It wasn't fabricated. It wasn't conjured up. It was just holy and pure. It was a pure worship. I, I've seen the glory of God come in so strong that when it would come in, I'd literally be on the platform sometime and thinking to myself, Lord, I hope I get to make it home tonight. Because the power was so strong, I didn't even know if I'd even be able to make it home that night. I didn't know if I'd be able to live under the kind of pres presence that was coming in during that worship. It was awesome. So, during that period of time, revival hadn't been going on but just a few weeks, maybe a couple months at the most, maybe three months. And the place was packed out at Brownsville. People everywhere. You couldn't get in the building. People everywhere. And I remember Lyndall was in worship and the glory came in the building. And it was like, Jesus, Holy Spirit, my God. I've never felt anything like this. Before. And you'd have to just brace yourself and keep your balance because you'd just fall right on the floor. So I remember there's a woman down here with her husband. Her husband's a big burly man, and she was a tall, slender lady. And all of a sudden, she's looking at her husband, and she just started screaming. <laughs> you know, and even though we're in revival, and I'm a Pentecostal preacher, if you go scream in my church, you need a pretty good reason to scream in my church. <laughs> so she's done that. <laughs> and he's staring at her husband. So I reached over, grabbed a handheld microphone like this, and I ran down there. She never saw me coming, didn't care that I was coming. And so when I got down on the floor level, I looked at her eyes, and I looked at what her eyes was looking at, and she was looking at her husband's hand. And he was a former Vietnam veteran. And when he was in Vietnam, they threw a bomb in, uh, threw a grenade in on him in his tent with his soldiers, and he reached in and picked up the grenade and was throwing the grenade, and he threw it, but when he was throwing it, it exploded and blew off part of his hand. His hand was growing back. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it. It blew the meat off of his fingers. His fingers was dry and gnarled up. And I looked over there and she was ah! like that. When I saw it, I said, ah! <laughs> yeah. We screamed to do it. For Jesus, hallelujah. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I, here's what I saw. I looked over there, and it looked like, it honestly looked like, 
an invisible laser came that you couldn't see the laser, but it was creating skin, whip stitching skin. Like that, just whip stitching skin over those fingers like that. And I got in on the tail end of it, and it was finishing up on these fingers. And when it got through, he was <laughs> looking at his hand like that. But the meat on his fingers matched the tan on his hand. Exactly. My God, don't do no junk, friend. Come on and help me. I said, God, don't do no junk. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Then I looked at the meat on the pink part of his hand, and the meat on the pink part of his hand matched his pink of the rest of his hand. It was a perfect match. Now, wouldn't it have been bad if the Lord had said, oh, shucks, I came close. I just couldn't do it. Yeah, I mean, it matched perfect. You couldn't tell. That man came back to Brownsville, I can't tell you how many times, and testified to that miracle. And so what the Holy Spirit showed me was, in the days of the Brownsville Revival, when the glory of God would come in, we'd begin to see those kinds of miracles. Now, please hear me. Please hear me. Just listen to me. I've seen it. I know that it's real. I beheld it. I felt it. And I know that's where we're headed. And God is about to do great and mighty things. And believe me, revival can break out like a wildfire and sweep almost the whole nation up in just a matter of days. In just a matter of days. God can break out on March the 7th and by the 14th the whole nation can be ablaze. Stand to your feet. Come on. Stand, it's all right. Ooh. I just made up my mind. <laughs> I'm a lot like a drug addict. <laughs> Once you get a shot of this, nothing else will ever satisfy. You. Nothing else will ever satisfy. You. 
You know what? We had all kind of criticism at Brownsville. We had major preachers blasting us and saying it was of the devil and it wasn't of God and it was all hype. But you know what? You know what kept me? Is every night when I went in there, every time I walked in, I felt the presence of the glory. And when you're in the glory, it don't matter what anybody says. It, it just doesn't matter what anybody says. You know you're safe. You know the Lord is with you. And you know that this is real. And you know that that's going to eventually die off. But the glory is going to remain. Well, let me talk to you about Moses for a minute. <clears throat> Moses' first encounter with God was a glory encounter. I don't know if you've ever thought about it or not, but let me explain it to you. Yes. The bush burned. Yes. Moses drew near, and the bush is burning, but it won't be consumed. Let me tell you something about the glory. The glory fire is a powerful fire, but it's not deadly. It won't consume nothing. But it's a fire. So now Moses is in the presence of God like Adam used to be. Revelation came to Moses while he was at the burning bush on how to deliver two and a half million Jews from Egyptian bondage. Now let me explain something to you about Moses real quick. <clears throat> Moses' life was divided up into three forties. Moses' life was divided up into three forties. From the time he was born and he was raised in Pharaoh's household. He spent 40 years. Now think about this. Just go back with me and think about it for a minute. He was raised in Pharaoh's household. He used to crawl around Pharaoh's throne. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. He was raised in Pharaoh's throne room. Pharaoh's daughter would take Moses in because she adopted him as her own. She found a wet nurse to nurse him, not realizing it was the kid's own mother. <laughs> Don't God have a sense of humor? <laughs> and she's walking around with this baby. She lets him down on the floor. He's crawling up to Pharaoh. He's crawling all around the throne. He's getting acclimated to the throne. He's getting acclimated to power. He's getting acclimated to power, kingly rule. He sees all these people around Pharaoh. His guard, and he sees power, raw power. And he sees the palace, and he sees the regal he, he sees the regalia and all the regal power and all that kind of raw power. And he's used to it. He's raised around it. He's used to it. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, okay, I got it. But one day, he kills an Egyptian, and he has to flee. Well, John Brown, when he flees, he can't come back to Egypt. He has to run for his life as a fugitive. And he goes out in the desert, and there's a man out there tending sheep. Well, who was that? That was Jethro of the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> there was Jethro out there. And what's Jethro doing? Listen, when Moses was in the first 40 years of his life, he saw raw power. When he goes out in the desert and he's running for his life, he comes up on the shepherd, and the shepherd's a sweet shepherd man. He's a sweet man. He tenderly watches over the sheep. Now God's got Moses out of the halls of power, and he's got him under a shepherd, and the shepherd shows him how to care for God's people, how to pet them, how to make sure when they eat there's not briars that's going to hurt them, how to put salve and oil on them when they come in at the end of the day how to hold them and speak nothing to them, sweet nothing. Moses married Jethro's daughter, spent 40 years with him. Jethro taught him how to bring water out of a desert. Because when Moses gets in the wilderness, leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, they're going to need to learn all these things that the shepherd's going to teach him. After that 40 years was up, now Moses has learned to be a shepherd. He's going to be a king shepherd is what Moses is going to be. He's going to be a man of power. He's going to be the greatest man besides Christ. The leadership, the greatest leader that ever lived. He learned it in the halls of power of Pharaoh. 
They learned the tender part of it about how to be a shepherd under Jethro. And now, the last 40 years of his life, he's out keeping the sheep, and the bush starts burning, and the Lord says, Moses, take your shoes off. The place where you're standing is holy ground. In other words, what he's saying is, you're in the glory, son. Come over here, but don't approach me haphazardly. Approach me with respect. So Moses went over there, and here's what the Lord said to him. He said, I'm going to give you a plan, and I'm going to show you how to deliver these children of Israel from this grip of Pharaoh. And God said, I want you to go back into Egypt, and I want you to go back into Pharaoh's household. I want you to go back in Pharaoh's court, and I want you to tell him, I am that I am, said, let my people go. Moses said, say what? <laughs> say what? Go back into Pharaoh's house? Yeah. What God's saying is I put you 40 years there where you get acclimated to it and not be intimidated by it. I'm going to send you back in there. It's going to be familiar territory, and don't you be afraid of anybody. You know, sometimes God will put you in situations where he's going to use you at a later time, but he's trying to teach you don't be afraid of anybody anywhere at any time. <laughs> Because I am with you. And I will never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. Open your mouth wide. Speak what I give you. And don't you run. Woo! Well. Moses went back in there. And he said. Pharaoh. I am that I am. Said let my people go. Pharaoh said, says what? Say who? And so Pharaoh called his magicians in, and they all threw their rods down. You know, all the big boys got to play. You know, they got, they got to show their strength. Like. So they all threw their rods down, and Moses held his rod to the last. Theirs became snakes, but, you know, God always holds a trump card. Yeah. No pun intended. <laughs> God always holds a trump card. And watch this. Moses threw his rod down, and his rod was a king snake. It ate all their snakes up. Let me tell you something about God. God will let the devil show out and show off, but in the end, God's going to have the last word. You can bet on it. I said, God is going to have the last. He's going to have the last word. Say it with me. He's going to have the last word. But now watch this now. Moses says, "Okay." God sends the plagues, all this thing. And so finally, Moses go before Pharaoh. He said, okay, we're leaving. They left. When they got out to the wilderness, and they got out to the Red Sea, God told Moses, he said, now, when you cross the Red Sea and you get over in the wilderness, he said, um, you're going to be in there for 40 years, and it's going to be a journey under and in my glory for 40 years because you said you wouldn't go without my presence so he said here's my presence you'll see it coming in the morning you'll see it coming like a cloud out of the east he said it looked like a cloud and he said that'll be my glory and he said there'll be a pillar of cloud at night and it'll be on fire and he said when you see that pillar of cloud at night that fire at night he said that's my glory and in the daytime I'll have the temperature perfect where people won't be sunburned, they won't faint, they won't get sick. He said it would be a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. So at nighttime, whenever they got in the wilderness and got all settled in, at nighttime, there were kids that was born in the wilderness. And when they were born in the wilderness, right after they left Egypt, there were kids that all they ever knew their whole life for the next 40 years, they, many of them just newborns, all they ever knew was the glory. They lay down at night, those little kids, and they grew up every night. Like the roar of an engine. The glory of God. Fire. Fire. And in the daytime, pillar of cloud by day. And when it came time for them to go into the land of promise, many of them didn't want to go into the land of promise. Why? Because they said, we don't want to leave the glory. 
is the glory going in with us? And he said, Joshua said, no. The man is going to stay out there, and that presence is going to stay out there. Many of them didn't want to go in. You remember? You remember that? You remember some of the tribes didn't want to go in? They settled. Listen to this. <clears throat> Moses, the last 40 years of his life, lived in that glory every night, fire, every day in the daytime, the glory. The glory was so strong that the Bible said their shoes wouldn't wear out because when you're in the glory, nothing wears out. Everything's renewed. Now follow me just for a minute. Follow me just for a minute. So they're in the wilderness. The clothes won't wear out. The shoes won't wear out. That's bad news for women. <laughs> the clothes wouldn't wear out. The shoes wouldn't wear out. And the Bible says it came time for Moses to die. Now, he'd been in the glory for 40 years. And it came time for him to die. It's time now for Joshua to take over. And here's what the Bible says. <clears throat> Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. Now stop right there just for a minute. It's not that the Bible is saying he died according to the word of the Lord. He died. It's saying that he died according to the word of the Lord. The Lord had to give him a command to die. You know why? Because he had so much glory in him, he couldn't even die. And he's 120 years old. Three sets of 40s. Look what it says now, look. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him, God buried him in the valley of the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knows of his sepulcher to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim. You know why his eye was not dim? Because he was in the glory all the time. You know what that means? There was no opticians in the wilderness. There was no, there was no glasses. And it said his natural forces was not abated. That meant he was still able to have children. He still was a virile man at 120 years old. Why? Because he was in the glory and his body wouldn't wear out. He still produced testosterone. So the Lord had to say, come over here a minute, Moses. It's time for you to go, but I got a problem. <laughs> I'll have to give you the word, son. Die! <laughs> but listen to this. Listen to this. His body was under the glory, so his body wasn't ready to die. He'd been in that glory for 40 years, and the glory causes you to be renewed day by day. That's what I'm talking about, about the glory in these last days. See, there's people that we all know we're about to face some stuff. We all know that things have changed in 2020. We all know that nothing's the same. But what I'm trying to tell you is, even though we're going into some extremely difficult days, we're going to have two things with us, the glory and the angels. The glory and the angels. Come on. Come on, help me. The glory and the angels. Go ahead, give me a break. Go ahead. It's all right. So their clothes wouldn't wear out, their shoes wouldn't wear out. And the Bible says when Moses got ready to die, he called all the children of Israel around him, all two and a half million of them. <clears throat> he, said, he said unto them, You've seen all that the Lord has done before your eyes in the land of Egypt unto Pharaoh. And unto all of his servants and unto all of his land and the great temptations which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great miracles. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear unto this day. I led you these 40 years in the wilderness and your clothes did not wax old upon you and neither did your shoe wax old upon your foot. Now what Moses is saying there is God is having to give me a command to die because I've been in the glory so long my body don't want to die. Your clothes and your shoes wouldn't wear out because you've been in the glory all this time. They kept their teeth. They didn't go blind. They didn't have to have uh, radiology in the wilderness. 
They didn't have to have EKGs in the wilderness. God kept them, every one. The glory kept them. That's another thing I want to say. I'm not worried about vaccines, and I'm not worried about pandemics. Listen, because the God that kept Israel can keep us in the days to come. Somebody pray to God. Now, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to venture out in that territory about vaccines and all that, because I know a lot of people's taken them. And I know a lot of people are afraid to take them, so I'm not even going to go there. That's not, that don't, that, I'm not going to concern myself with that. I'm just saying this, that the presence of God and the glory of God is well able to take care of you. <laughs> See, there was, no, there was no hospitals, there was no ambulances, there was no funeral homes in the wilderness. God just took care of them. And I believe today's coming where God's going to take care of us the very same way. But I'll, I'll get, if I, if, I, if I don't get off of that, I'm going to get messed up. <laughs> Let's talk about Elijah just for a minute. Did you know right now, Elijah told Elisha, he said, now son, if you see me when I go, you've asked for a double portion. He said, if you see me when I go, I'll grant you a double portion. He said, okay. So God sent a vortex. He sucked Elijah up off the earth in a vortex like a tornado. There was a fiery chariot waiting there. It was not a, a chariot manufactured on the earth. It was a fiery chariot. It was a glory chariot. It was a glory wagon. It was a glory wagon. Moses flopped down in it. I mean, uh, Elijah flopped down in it. There was an angel driving the chariot. How many of you know if you don't get in the chariot, you better have a driver? Because you don't know where you're going. And about that time... The angel said, up! Pew! And just as they were heading straight up, Elijah said, oh, I forgot Elisha. And he pulled his mantle off and he dropped it down. And it just went floating down to the earth. And Elijah went into heaven. And I want to tell you something. Now listen to me. Listen to me, everybody. Elijah is still in heaven to this day in his natural body. That means... He's got his natural eyeballs. He's still got his teeth. There's no dentist in heaven. He doesn't need glasses. He, he doesn't have respiratory problems. He doesn't have coronary problems. He's still alive in heaven right now. Perfect health after thousands of years. Why? Because in the glory you can't die. You remember what our forefathers used to say, our old grannies and grandpas and the Lord used to say? Honey, one day I'm going to die and I'm going on to the Lord. I'm going to be with the Lord in glory. You ever heard them say that? I'm going to glory. You know what they were saying? I'm going to a place where you can't die. And I'm going to a place where there'll be no more tears. There'll be no more labor. There'll be no more sorrow. I'm going to glory. And I believe we can have some of that glory on this earth before we leave here. Now listen to this. So the Bible said, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire in verse 11. So he's still alive to this day, and he parted them both asunder. Elijah went up in a whirlwind, and Elijah went over and picked, Elisha went over and picked up that mantle. And so in heaven, time does not exist in heaven, so Elijah has not grown old in heaven. And you can't die and grow old in the glory. Even clothes won't wear out in the glory. Shoes won't wear out in the glory. The body won't wear out in the glory. And so that's where Elijah's been. But now this is interesting. I, I've been trying to get here all night, and I, I'm skipping a bunch of stuff to get here. It came to pass after eight days. Now just listen to this. This is so good. This is so good. Somebody say, this is so good. Say it one more time. This is so good. It came to pass after about eight days. He took Peter and James and John and went up into a mountain to pray. As he prayed, oh my goodness, look what happened here. The fashion, the structure, the architecture, the DNA of his face changed and was altered. 
And his raiment started glistening like glitter. His, his garment started glistening like glitter. And the structure of his face changed. And behold, look who shows up. <laughs> Two glory men. <laughs> Elijah, that's still alive and hadn't died, and he was caught up into glory. And Moses, who God said had to say, just flat out die, boy. Come on. <laughs> you know? So now here they are, and they're with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Okay, now watch this. Who appeared in glory. Now they appeared in glory. They didn't appear in heaven, but they appeared in glory. What does that mean? They appeared in an atmosphere of the brilliance of God. And they spake, Jesus spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And they were awake. When they were awake, they saw his glory and two men that stood with him. Now, y'all, anybody ever remember at Brownsville how I'd always lay over in that chair on the platform? I'd lay over in that chair. And I wasn't asleep. I was always totally awake, but I just lost, I couldn't sit up anymore. I understand the scripture now about Peter <clears throat> when it said, and when they were with him were heavy with sleep. My eyes would drop. I'd be totally awake. I could hear everything, but I had no control over my body. It's just like I had no body. Now I understand that I was in the glory. See? I was in the glory. And so the Bible said, when they saw his glory in the two minutes that stood with him, there appeared a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into that cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. But here's something I want you to see. It says, After six days he took with him Peter, James, and John, led him up into a very high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now look this way just for a minute. Listen to me. The only way that the disciples had ever known Jesus was under the anointing. But now they're seeing him for the first time in the glory. And now they're seeing his face is configured and altered. His face is altered. It's like he's, who is this? Oh my God. And that glory is so powerful that the Bible says, you remember, that their clothes wouldn't wear out? Well, God let the disciples see the glory get on Jesus' clothes, and they started sparkling. It even got in the cloth that he was wearing. You remember the Bible says that when Moses went up and met with the Lord, that the glory was so strong they had to put a veil over his face? And when he came down, his face, even veiled, was so bright Israel couldn't stand to look upon him. The glory of God got in that veil that covered his face. They were wearing masks back then. <laughs> Social distancing back then. <clears throat> but what happened was the disciples had been around Jesus for three and a half years, and all they ever knew him as was anointed. He said, this day as the Spirit of the Lord upon me has anointed me to preach the gospel, etc., 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 lay hands on the sick, cast out devils. And they only knew him in the anointing. But now, before he left, he wanted to take them apart to a high mountain. He said, I want to show you there's more. I want to show you there's more. And I want to show you that his face, the visage of his face was altered. And he started glistening like he was in full of glitter. And the glory of the Lord was all over him. Now they saw him in glory. And they awakened, the disciples awakened to see a different dimension so that they could see Jesus. Listen, let me, let me give you this passage about Moses. This is in Exodus about Moses. Now, this is not Christ. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with two tablets of testimony, <clears throat> when he came down from Mount, <clears throat> Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. Now, li listen to me just a minute. When the glory of God gets on your clothes, they'll glitter and glisten. And it even gets in the skin. It gets in the skin. And the skin of a human being, the Bible says, will cause your face to shine. Cause the face to shine. You know what the Bible says in heaven? There'll be no more need of the sun. You know why? Because Jesus Christ himself will be so bright he's going to light the whole planet of heaven.
Just his face. Just his face. And he said, the skin of his face shone in verse 30, and they were afraid to come nigh to Moses. Let me, let me close. I'm going to close. I've been going a long time. How long have I been going? 50 minutes. I'm going to close. I've got five or six more minutes. Can you stay with me just for a minute? <clears throat> I'm having to eliminate a whole bunch of stuff out of here. But if you want to get this, you can go to my website and just order Mysteries of the Glory, and you can get it all. Let me, let me close. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, how do we, how do we, if we, if we start seeking the glory of God, how do we begin to move in the glory? We understand how to move in the anointing, but how do we move in the glory? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because here's the way it happens. Look at this in closing. Paul said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now, wait just a minute. Let's back up. Afflictions that we go through, misunderstandings, people persecuting us, attacking us, the devil attacking us, the devil attacking us through people, the things that, the hardships we have to go through. He said, our light afflictions, which is just but for a moment, they work for us and they work in us an eternal weight of glory. In other words, what it's saying is, the things that you suffer will cause your glory to increase. The things that you suffer. In other words, when you suffer for him and you go through things and you're wondering, Lord, why in the world do I go through these things? you got to remember this. When you come out of it on the other side, there's always a heavier weight of glory on it. Let me show you something. Watch this. You remember when Jesus was in Gethsemane? And the Bible says that the Lord gave him the cup to drink. Remember that? And Jesus said, I've got to drink this cup. It was a cup of, it was the sins of the world. He said, I've got to drink this cup. He was afflicted. He was, he was under a heavy, a heavy burden. He was going through it. His sweat turned into great drops of blood. It was the most horrifying thing that you've ever seen a human go through. It was a physical thing, but it was a spiritual, spiritual, spiritual battle. And when he cleared that, when he cleared that Gethsemane thing, then he goes into the tomb, or he goes into the garden, rather, excuse me. He's sitting around with the disciples, and in just a minute, here comes Judas, and he's got the soldiers with him, and they all got lit, lighted torches. They come walking in the garden. And Jesus sees them come walking in, and he just says in a casual voice, Whom seek ye? <laughs> it threw his, just his voice threw them around like rag dogs. The soldiers was tumbling around like, like, like a bomb exploded in the garden. You know what that was? When Jesus went through what God made him go through, God increased the glory of God so much on Jesus that when he just spoke a normal word, it threw men around like rag dolls. <clears throat> and that's why Peter said, that's why Peter reached over and took that, that sword and he thought, boy, here's my opportunity. I'm gonna get me some head. I'm gonna cut me a head off here. <laughs> and so he swung and he hit Malchus's ear and cut it off. Jesus walked right over there and just put it right back on. I think I'd said, Jesus, what, what? You know, he just put the ear right back on. But, when Jesus just said in a casual voice, whom seek ye? Here's what I'm trying to say. I believe the day's going to come that we're all going to go through things that may shock us to even think about it, what's coming. But if you'll go through it and keep a sweet spirit and don't bail out, when you come out on the other side, there's going to be such an authority in your voice. When you preach, people have a hard time setting up under the words you're preaching. When you preach under the glory of God, there's going to be such a wave of the glory of God that's going to come in that place. Even when you talk to people behind the counter in a department store, they're going to have a hard time standing up. Why? Because there's glory that's been increased upon your life. When the worship team sings, when the worship team sings, they're going to sing with such glory on their voices. When preachers preach and evangelists and pastors preach, there's going to be such glory on their voices. 
the people that have a hard time sitting up in the pews. That's the kind of power that's coming. And I close with this. The thing that I preach to you tonight is not some kind of an ethereal mystery. The thing I preach to you tonight is it's coming just as sure as I stand here. I want you to be ready for it. I have felt it. I have experienced it. It's real. I'd walk down off the platform at Brownsville many nights, and Tony's right here with me. He's traveled with me all these many years, 25 years together. I'd walk down off that platform. He'd be right by my side. <clears throat> I'd walk off that platform on that main floor, and there'd be such a river of the glory of God running through that church that when you got down on the main floor, it would just take you. a glory river and just take you and I have literally done this before put my feet in the carpet trying to not go that way and it just it was that strong just that strong now you might be sitting out there saying oh but brother Kilpatrick are you serious well do you think I'd get up here and preach something like this if I wasn't serious <laughs> I mean, really come on I'm not going to talk about stuff like this if it's not if it's not something that God's about to do. I just want you, when you see it, to remember what I'm telling you. It's coming as sure as I stand here. God bless you. Thank you very much.